it may be early in the season, and the Cincinnati Reds look like they're not going to have a good one, but they have to make some critical decisions now for the future of the team and the popularity of what should be a great regional franchise. This is Locked On MLB. You are Locked On MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast we talk about all of Major League Baseball. Thanks so much for making us your first listen as we're available on all your free podcasting catchers. Today's episode is brought to you in part by BlueNile.com. I hope you got that jewelry for your mom on Mother's Day. We had a big sale for it. Read a lot of copy for it. I hope you took advantage of it. Who am I? I'm telling exactly who I am. My name is Paul Francis Sullivan. Please, if you see me on YouTube, you can call me Sully. And on this episode, which is being dropped on the 11th day of May 2022, we are going to be talking about that critical decisions that the Cincinnati Reds have to make now. And if they're going to make any changes, now's the time to do it. Because next spring, we're a little more than a year from now, could potentially be a real turning point for that franchise. What am I talking about? We'll tell you about it shortly after telling you. You can follow us at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter and on Instagram. I'm your pal, Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. One of the worst teams I ever saw in my life played for the Detroit Tigers in the early 2000s. They nearly lost 120 games. But that year yielded Justin Verlander to the Tigers. The Washington Nationals were an abomination in the late 2000s. But that led to the draft picks of Bryce Harper and the draft picks of Steven Strasburg. All those led to quality, solid teams, trips to the World Series, and all this stuff for two franchises who turned it around pretty quickly. Now, we all know the idea of tanking is something that baseball really has to deal with the idea that there are some teams out there that have just basically waved the white flag and say we stink and we're not even going to put a major league product on the field is a travesty and something that baseball it has to address because if they don't then you're seeing teams that are not making the effort to put a major league uh major league product on the field. And that's an abomination. Because first of all, it inflates win totals for the good teams. It makes there are certain punching bags you can have. And it's just not fair for a fan base. If you're having teams that just say, we're not even trying going into April. Now, there's a difference, I believe, between rebuilding and tanking. It's subtle, and you could very easily claim your tanking is simply a form of rebuilding. There are teams that have gone out there and said, you know what? We aren't good now, and we're not going to be good in five years. We're not going to be good in 10 years the way we're constituted now. So if we're going to be bad, let's just rebuild what we've got from within. Now, the two best examples of that in recent years have been the Houston Astros and the Chicago Cubs, both of whom were god-awful. So they traded away everything that wasn't nailed down, flooded their farm system with prospects, drafted well, thank you very much. Hello, Carlos Correa. Hello, Chris Bryant. And next thing you know, their teams are quality teams playing in the postseason and winning a World Series title. It's odd, though. The Astros whiffed on two number one overall picks, and yet they still picked enough good players like Correa, like George Springer, to put the team together. The Cubs also did a very good job of not just drafting well, but building well through their farm system. To get that key player in the draft, you know, they're usually available high up there, and they could be the type of player that you can build around. Now, baseball is not the same as basketball. 
In basketball, you could draft someone, and the very next year after they're drafted, they're on your team. Then sometimes they can start. They can draft them right out of college, sometimes out of high school. It's different in baseball that there are sometimes situations where a player gets drafted, and next thing you know, they're in the major leagues. But most of the time, it takes a couple of years to come up to their farm system. There is a gauntlet that players have to run through, obviously. And you can have situations where the rebuild turns into a whiff. How long did the Pirates rebuild? How many times did they have a number one overall pick and they choked? The Baltimore Orioles choked with some picks and choked with one of their big trades when they kept Manny Machado for one year too long. And when they finally traded him to Los Angeles, none of the players they got back in exchange for him have been worth their weight and you know what. It's critical if you have a team that stinks and you know you've got a draft pick coming up to not whiff, to not blow it. And the Cincinnati Reds are going into this year where they know, look at, they traded away. They tanked. They traded away Gray. They traded away. They didn't let Castellanos come about. They traded away everybody. They made the big deal with Seattle, Suarez, and everybody being sent there. And they didn't get players back to help the team that, mind you, was a wild card team in September. With about half a month of September left, they were tied for a wild card spot. In 2021, this is not a team that stunk last year. And it's not exactly playing in the greatest powerhouse division. Yes, Milwaukee is a fine team, as is St. Louis. But it's not like either one of them are the 1927 Yankees. A quality team with some decent pitching and some good bats. Boom. You have a shot. They're winning year last year. They made the playoffs the year before that. Yes, it was the truncated COVID season. But. They went into this year, they put two sticks of dynamite in. And I think that probably David Bell, poor David Bell, is probably going to catch the brunt of this. But the fact of the matter is, the pressure is not on David Bell. The ownership of the Reds have to take a nice, long, hard look at Nick Kral and Sean Pender and Brad Mador to say, are you the three guys that we're entrusting a lousy season to? Because if they're not, bring in the new guys right now. Now, who are the names I just said? Obviously, if you're a baseball fan, you know that David Bell is the manager of the Reds, comes from a long lineage of Bell family members, including Gus Bell and Buddy Bell. Uh, Nick Crow is the general manager, the vice president general manager of the team. Okay, Sean Pender is the farm director. Brad Mador is the scouting director. You have to look at those three now. Now and say, do we want to give you the car keys for what is going to be the most critical pick the Reds are going to have in a long time? Are these the three that you want to redeem what is going to be a hundred, maybe 110 loss disaster. Because if they're not, fire them now and get the ones you want in now. If you want someone else, make that move now. Because then you can have someone who can evaluate the system, take a look at what's going around there, and figure out who the best player is to pick. Get someone that you know that will be the one to make the right decision for the team. Now, it could very well be them. I don't know Nick Crawl, Sean Pender, or Brad Mador, and chances are, unless you're in the front office of the Cincinnati Reds, chances are you don't know them either. But this first-round pick is, for so many ways, I, I'm not going to overstate this, the soul of the Reds. This is for the team to go finish the decade either a disaster or a potential sleeping giant of a franchise that for most of this decade has laid dormant. When Dusty Baker showed up, surprise, they got to be good again because that's what Dusty Baker does. 
and Bruce hits a home run, they win the division. They nearly get to the NLCS if, if uh, Scott Rowland fly ball doesn't hook foul. They lose a wild card game, and then they don't do anything save for one trip to the postseason during the COVID year. They finally had a Cy Young Award winner. It was uh, Trevor Bauer. Problematic. They have to get the next great Reds star to be said along the same words as Joey Votto or Frank Robinson or Bench or Rose or Larkin or whomever it is. It has to be a big name, one whose number is going to go up alongside all the retired numbers in Cincinnati. Why? Because otherwise, this is a lost decade. This could be a disaster. You have to find that next great person. And if Medor, Pender, and Crawl, the law firm of Crawl, Peter, and, and, and Pender, and Medor are not the three who you're going to trust us, guess what? Pick it now. Pick the new person now. There are major league whiffs that can happen. And you do not want to see this. And do you know what? Maybe the Reds have to go online and look. Look for people with the right resume. Look for people who make the right decision. And if you're going to do that, guess what? They should probably use LinkedIn Jobs. It's there to make it easy to find people that you want to talk to and hire faster and for free. You can use it too. You can create a job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people, including your pal Sully. Add your job with a purple hashtag hiring frame on your LinkedIn profile. Spread the word that you're hiring so the network can help you find the right people. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you want to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash MLB. That's LinkedIn.com slash LockdownMLB. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks so much for making Lockdown MLB your first listen. For your next listen, check out the Lockdown Now podcast, recaps of Major League Baseball games with analysis from our local experts, taking fans through the season like no other, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You know, it's sometimes the first pick in the draft just seems so obvious you know sometimes it just seems like all right yeah you you, you've got we know who we're going to get but you can whiff badly and there are lots of instances where you see teams have the number one pick in the draft and they draft someone who's not that great or sometimes it's like when the Padres drafted Matt Bush instead of Justin Verlander or sometimes there's an Aiken who gets hurt or moves on to something else I can't help but always think about the 2009 draft and Steven Strasburg was heads and shoulders the player that everybody wanted to have. And the I do not begrudge the Nationals for drafting him. He was an ace, and when they finally did win the World Series, guess who was the World Series MVP? That would be Steven Strasburg. And then you had all these other teams, and there were some decent picks in that. Um, Zach Wheeler was in the sixth, was the sixth pick overall. Mike Miner and Mike Leake both had nice careers. Uh, Drew Storm had a good career until he kind of flamed out. AJ Pollock is still playing. Um, you know, Kyle Gibson had a good, was a good pick. Randall Gritchick had a good pick, was a good pick then. So was, um, James Paxton was available. Brad Boxberger, Garrett Richards, both had, uh, uh, major league careers, but you had several teams with badly. The Padres had the number three pick overall. They drafted Donovan Tate, never made it to the major leagues. The Pirates had the number Four pick overall. They drafted Tony Sanchez, who was supposed to be the next great catching star. He whiffed badly. Matt Hobgood was given the number five overall pick by Baltimore, ahead of all those other names that I just mentioned. He never played a game in the major leagues. Players like Jacob Turner made it to the majors, didn't really contribute that much. Same with Grant Green, Matt Perk. And, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna right now list, after Steven Strasburg, the Mariners drafted Dustin Ackley. I played some in the major leagues. 
Donovan Tate with, for the Padres, Sanchez with the Pirates, Matt Hobgood with the Orioles, Zach Wheeler with the Giants. That turned out to be a good pick. They traded away for uh, Carlos Beltran. Mike Leake drafted by the Reds. Jacob Turner with the Tigers. Drew Storen with the Nationals. Tyler Matzik with the Royals, uh, the Rockies. Aaron Crow with the Royals. Grant Green with the A's. Nick Burke with the Rangers. Alex White with Cleveland. Uh, the Diamondbacks, Bobby Boschering, never made it to the major leagues. Uh, A.J. Pollock, the, Mar the Marlins drafted Chad James, never made it to the major leagues. Cardinals drafted Shelby Biller. Blue Jays drafted Chad Jenkins. Astros drafted Giovanni Meyer, never made it to the majors. Twins drafted Kyle Gibson. White Sox drafted Gerald Mitchell, never made it to the majors. And the Angels drafted Randall Grichick. Now, why did I just list out the top 24 picks in the 2009 draft like that? Okay, I'm going to give the Nationals – a mulligan, okay? Think about every other team I just mentioned. Some went on to have great success in the 2010s. Some went on to stink. And some went on to not have an identity. The 25th pick in the 2009 draft belongs to the Yankees. But the Yankees lost that pick because they signed Mark Teixeira. Now, the rules were different then. You could pick up a draft pick for a signed player, even if they didn't play the full season. If the rules had applied let, you know, later on, the Yankees would have had the 25th overall pick. Why am I fixated on the 25th overall pick in the 2009 amateur draft? I'll tell you exactly why. It was Mike Trout. The best player of this generation was available at the number 25 pick that the Angels got for letting Mark Teixeira take a walk. The Mariners could have had Trout. The Padres, Pirates, Orioles, Giants, Braves, Reds, Tigers. Nationals had another pick there. Rockies, Royals, A's, Rangers, Cleveland, Arizona, Miami, St. Louis, Toronto, Houston, Minnesota, Chicago White Sox. All of them could have had Mike Trout. They didn't. Some of the players they drafted instead of Mike Trout tied me with games played in the major leagues. Every one of those scouting departments whiffed. Whiffed. They had a generational player available. Now, they may not have known. Maybe this shows the unreliability of drafting. But this is the sort of thing that the Reds can't have. They can't have a situation where they have a high draft pick and the people in charge whiff. In the draft that Mike Trout was available at number 25, two of the th two of the top five picks never made it to the major leagues. Reds can't afford this. They cannot afford this. And one of the reasons why they can't afford this, besides the idea of just not wanting to blow a chance to draft like this, is the Reds, almost as much as any team in baseball, have the chance to become a borderline super team. They have tremendous history, passionate fans, and they can reach back to a history that goes back to the 19th century. They play in a gorgeous ballpark. And, yeah, the Bengals made the Super Bowl last year. Fine. But the Bengals aren't the chief team of Cincinnati. You think of the Reds first. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. But they can also pull from Canton, Columbus, Louisville, Indianapolis, a lot of other cities. They can pull from that. They can be a gravitational pull, similar to the Red Sox, what they have throughout New England. They have that whole region to pull from. Boston's a decent-sized city, but it's not a metropolis, but it's a mega market because of where they draw from. And the the, the fact that Red Sox fans travel well across the country. You have all these people from that region. The Reds should be one of those great teams with a packed house and fans that you go back, oh, those are great fans, the Red fans, and blah, 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 blah. It should just be Jeff Carr out there, a handful of other people waxing poetic about the big red machine and Barry Larkin. They have a chance to do this in the Central. And I've been screaming about the fact that the Reds have a chance to be a regional giant team. 
and they've been acting like a tiny small market team. And maybe step one is to find that Mike Trout out there, to find that great Reds player, that great Reds legend. It's critical. This is a team that could truly be one of the great franchises in baseball. They already have the history. They do. They almost have the hard part done. They just have to put a good team together and win the Central a bunch of times with a superstar. With a big superstar. And that's why the Reds, if this group of people are not the right people for it, you've got to make that decision right now. There's too much on the line here. A superstar that you could build around has to be drafted. Not a nice player. Oh, we turned into a major leaguer playing out of being the starting in the second base. No. A retired number red who's remembered as a red forever has to be drafted next year. Anything short of that makes this season a disaster. More so. Then you're tanking. You're not rebuilding. And then what do you give their fans? What are you going to give their fans? You got to give them something. You got to give them something as a consolation if you blow this. Maybe you got to give them a built Bar. Built Bars are the best tasting protein bars out there. They're healthy. They're delicious. No more sacrificing delicious food for health. With Built Bar, you can have both. All Built Bars and Puffs are covered in 100% real chocolate. That means Built Bar, you can eat healthy and enjoy doing it. The Puffs are fantastic. They got great flavors like banana cream pie and churro. Who doesn't want a protein bar taste like a churro? I know I want one. They're only 140 calories. Sign me up! And guess what? If that's not enough flavors for you, you can try the mix box that comes with 12 flavors of bars and puffs. I'm talking yum here. Built Bar, make sure there's something for everybody. You know what my favorite flavor is? It's raspberry. I love the tanginess of the raspberry mixed with the chocolate. It's fantastic. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar, which is a candy bar. Go to Built.com. Get all your favorites. Banana cream pie, raspberry, chocolate. Uh, what is it? Mint brownie. That's Stacey Gatsoulias' favorite. And so many more. They're delicious, and new flavors are coming out all the time. Check them out at Built.com. Go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCK15. Get 15% off your order. Go to Built.com for 15% off and use promo code LOCKED ON. Uh, let's just do a little bit of a uh, little bit of housework right here on uh, this day in baseball history. Bobby Witt was born. Happy birthday to Bobby Witt. Bobby Witt had a wild, weird career. He pitched for 16 seasons. Uh, came up as a uh, quality pitcher with a very colorful, fun Texas Rangers team, and wound up playing from 1986 to 2001. Finished his career. The final game he pitched was in the 2001 World Series. And he got to be a you know a star pitcher for several years, playing the playoffs with a few different teams, and got a World Series ring for his troubles. And now he's probably going to be remembered as the father of Bobby Witt Jr., who was a uh, pick for the Kansas City Royals, who is currently on the team. Uh, he was the number two overall pick for the Royals in 2009. Both he and his dad were first round picks uh, by the. Uh, Adley Rutschman was the number one pick overall for the Orioles. We'll see if he turns into the star. But Bobby Wood Jr., uh, you know, looks like he's going to be a quality player already up there with the Kansas City Royals. So happy birthday, Bobby Wood Sr. You are a proud papa to be sure. Hey, uh, on this day in baseball history, the Giants traded Willie Mays to the Mets. It was a move as the Giants were in the middle of, you know, trying to retool and they didn't they didn't know whether or not Mays was going to be a star there for much longer and Mays knew his career was winding down and he wanted to finish his career where it started with the in New York playing for a national league team in New York but he had to make sure that his new manager was going to be okay with the fact that Willie Mays may only be a part-time player his manager was Yogi Berra they wound up agreeing to it, and Willie Mays wound up finishing his career with the New York Mets. Here's the deal. Who did they get? Who did the New York Mets trade to get Willie Mays? 
That would be Charlie Williams. Charlie Williams played for the Giants. Boy, no pressure on pitcher Charlie Williams saying, oh, you are the person who was acquired for Willie Mays. I'm going to go to baseballreference.com, the single greatest website in the history of the planet Earth, and give you a little look-see at the life of Charlie Williams, the player, the only player ever traded straight up for Willie Mays. He was, uh, let's open this up, and we're getting a little bit here, but uh, Charlie Williams was a right-handed pitcher. He pitched from 1971 to uh, 1978, and he pitched one season with the Mets as a spot starter reliever. He pitched uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven seasons with the San Francisco Giants. Uh, his best year being 1976, where he pitched to a 2.96 ERA and almost entirely out of the bullpen. And he got a whopping four career saves, was basically a decent middle reliever in exchange for Willie Mays, but it was not the Willie Mays, but you know what I'm saying. But, hey, tip your hat. Charlie Williams uh, sadly died in 2015. But uh, for those years, he can sort of look back and someone asks you, hey, you play in the major leagues? Yeah, for eight years. Were you any good? Well, I was once traded for Willie Mays. How bad could I have been? Well, folks. How bad could things be for the Reds? They could be really bad, especially if they whiff on this. So figure it out, Reds. Make the hard decision right now. Because what you don't want to have is a situation where the Reds draft that pick next year and then clean house. Make sure it's the house you want. Otherwise, it could be a disaster. And I don't want that, and neither do you. Follow us at Lockdown MLB Pod. Same handle on Instagram. I'm your pal, Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Giving the Reds a pretty fair warning. This has been Lockdown MLB for the 11th day of May, 2022. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully. <laughs>